I first met Arnie Toman on the 2015 running of the 2904 where we were racing against each other and I knew immediately that this was a man of many amazing stories. And so a couple of years later when we launched the VinWiki YouTube channel, he was one of my first calls. And obviously he's gone on to do a lot of amazing things, go on a lot of amazing drives, but these are his top 10 car stories that he's told here on the VinWiki channel. And just a reminder that this month of VinWiki Car Stories is brought to you by ModFind. Be sure to download the ModFind app for free. It allows you to buy, sell, even give a kickback as you're trying to transact your favorite things, parts, cars, everything, tools related to the automotive hobby. So be sure to download their app or visit their website and thank them for their continued support of VinWiki as you buy and sell the things we love about our cars. Merry Christmas from all of us here at VinWiki. Today we have a very special story about something that happened two years ago on Christmas Day. And we've waited to release it because two of the storytellers had some other record-setting drives in mind, which obviously they've done by now. And so today we have the story of Doug and Arnie's first drive together. This happened before their 27-25 run that beat my cannonball record back in 2019, before all the new COVID records, before the E63 got destroyed, and obviously before their most recent drive across the country in 25-39. But this is the story of their Southern Route record from Jacksonville to San Diego go kind of the trial run to see how the car worked and how they worked together before their goal of setting the cannonball record and so again it happened two years ago in 2018 and it started right here at my house and so this is the story of how they drove across the country in just 24 hours so what i looked to was to be the fastest person to ever cross the country from the Atlantic to the Pacific. The transcontinental route, Southern Trail, Old Spanish Trail as it's known, is the shortest distance between the Atlantic and Pacific. From Jacksonville Beach to Dog Beach in San Diego, 2,365 miles, which spans most of I-10 and runs through Texas, really close to the Mexican border, and is the southernmost route in the country. So the original plan was going to be me and Forrest, and we needed a third driver. So I enlisted Doug from Switch Cars, the Mexican Stig, to be our third driver. My name is Doug, and I'm addicted to speed. And after doing my first cannonball, I wanted something more. I wanted to have a real record, not a consolation record. And I had thought about doing the Southern Run, and I had befriended Arnie in the process of all this stuff and we started talking about 24 hours across the country and he and i had both done the same math and i decided that it was far wiser to try to convince him that i needed to be on his team rather than try to compete against him because he is a formidable force when it comes to cannonballing he brought me up to the a team so to speak and in, in my opinion cannonballing is kind of like boating the best type of cannonball car to have is somebody else's. So the plan was to meet at Ed's house just before Christmas and kind of stage the car and get everything ready with just a five hour jaunt down to Jacksonville to the start. The day before the run, Forrest had been kind of feeling under the weather but was thinking he'd be feeling better and was going to make it. And 24 hours before we're supposed to leave for Jacksonville, Forrest says that he's not gonna be able to make it. So I'm at dinner at Ed's house. You never know what's gonna happen when you go to dinner at Ed's house. Originally, I'd gone there to just, you know, have dinner and, and wish these guys well. They're going on a, on, a, on a Spanish trail run. Well, it turns out one of the drivers called in sick and they needed a third because this type of run is, you need three people, it, it's really intense. So it was a day before Christmas and I'm with my wife and we got all these dinner plans for tomorrow, Christmas day. And when these guys said they were gonna do it, I'm like, yeah, I'm in. And I said, well, I, I gotta ask the wife first. Come on, am I in? She's cool. She said, yeah, go for it. To me, the, my favorite part of cannonballing is actually building the car, you know, picking the perfect vehicle, something that's fast, comfortable, and kind of under the radar. So what I chose being the former vice president of AMS, I chose a 2015 Mercedes E63 AMG and fitted it with the Alpha 9 package. 
So it was great that Arnie was building this amazing ideal car for this event. And I could just be like, yeah, you should uh, add this, you know, electronic air horn or add that feature. And, you know, I just got to, to be the beneficiary of, of all that. So the E63 that I found was silver and was highly optioned with a carbon fiber package, the red AMG brakes that everybody wants. And none of that was going to do because I wanted to dumb this car down to make it look very unassuming. So I wrapped all the carbon in silver vinyl. I painted the red AMG calipers that everybody wants in gray. I coated the factory black sport wheels that everybody wants in silver. And then to top it all off, I covered up a lot of the tail lights with silver vinyl, which I ended up making a car that sort of looked like a mid 2000s Accord from the back which looked honestly terrible, but it ended up being a really good disguise for the car. They picked me up on the freeway, check this out. I even got a t-shirt from the event, which is more than most folks get for Cannonball. That's how I met them on the freeway. They picked me up near my house and we took off and went to Florida. We got a late start. We lost um, five or six minutes getting started. So the plan for this drive was to have Doug do the first stint. So with little traffic to contend with, Doug skillfully got the average speed to 100 miles an hour, then 110, then 115. And he had gotten it all the way up to 119 miles an hour in the first two hours. Arnie had been told that Christmas was the best day for doing this. And all of our research seemed to confirm this, that there would be the least amount of cops and the least amount of traffic. Complete crap. As Doug passed a underpass, there was a Florida State Patrol up at the top of the on-ramp, lights off, and blasted us with KA band from behind. Doug slammed on the brakes as hard as he could to get the car settled down and knock off as much speed as he could, but we knew we were in trouble. So I pull over and he comes up and there was no opportunity for, uh, do you know how fast you were going? 65. There was none of that. It was just, you know, license and registration. So I hand him my license with my FOP card. And given some of the other accoutrement on the car, he goes, are you a cop in Ohio? I was like, no, I just have a lot of friends. So he asked me why I was going so fast. And I just said, oh, you know, it's a nice clear night, open road, you know, don't see a need to, to go any slower. And he goes, well, what if a deer jumps out in front of you? So I just pointed to the thermal screen and said, oh, we got that. Was that going to stop a deer from jumping out? I go, no, but it'll help us to see it, which was actually good because I was worried he was going to start asking about all this stuff and I would have to explain it. But this gave me a great opportunity to just be like, yeah, yeah, got you on that one. What do you got next? So he goes, well, just uh, give me a minute. I'll be back and have you guys out of here. So he let us go 14 minutes later with a ticket for alleged speed of 117 in a 70 mile an hour zone so 47 miles an hour over on my first one so after doug's ticket he drove about another 10 miles and obviously didn't want to drive very fast in florida anymore so i kind of took over the wheel we had our average speed had dwindled from 118 miles an hour down to 103 overall so in my stint i slowly worked it back up nearing 110 and as we came into Louisiana, we got a nice long stretch on a bridge where there was no traffic coming at us, nothing coming up ahead of us. And I ran the thing up to 191 miles an hour. Probably could have hit 200, but I thought better keep it safe. Now, a friend of mine was texting me because he was watching our progress on Glimpse. And shortly before the cop nailed me at alleged 117, he texted me and goes, oh, I just checked the Glimpse, saw you at 117. That was the exact speed the cop got me at. And then he texts me and goes, oh man, welcome to Louisiana. It's all straight, flat, you know, no on-ramps, this and that. You can fly. And we get thick fog. I mean, I cannot see past our low beams. So I was like, dude, stop texting me. You're, you're cursing me every time. <laughs> Arnie, he is the man on binoculars at night. He spotted this guy like a mile and a half away. At night, the guy had no lights on, no reflective anything, but he goes, I, I think there's a cop up there. 
So I slowed down and the problem with that car though, it was so good at speed that I'd scrub off like 25 miles an hour thinking I'm going 75 and I was still going 90 and Arnie would be like, slow down, you're, you're still speeding. And so <laughs> I wouldn't look at my speedometer and he'd have to keep yelling at me to get slowed down so I wouldn't get a normal person ticket. Doug had been pretty careful to slow down past overpasses since his ticket. But as the morning progressed in Texas, he started to get a little more careless. And lo and behold, we got a blasted with K ban from yet another on-ramp. So he pulls me over, and of course, I'm curious what he actually got us for, because I was on my brakes, but I knew it wasn't good. And uh, this time he got me at an alleged 116. So wasn't able to beat my previous record, but uh, still an unfortunate ticket. And he wasn't quite as understanding as the previous gentleman, but uh, let us get away with a ticket and took 12 minutes of our time. So uh, I'm not sure which was more detrimental to the run. As we rode along, Simpson, who had really not planned to drive because he really didn't have experience driving something so fast, he kind of decided, you know, I'd like to give this a shot, but he told me that you know, I really don't want to drive quite as fast as you and Doug, but we're willing to give him a shot. Shortly after I had the farthest spot probably in history, um, I was on the binoculars and I spotted a cop's lights probably four miles out. I mean, it was so far out that it was another two miles, I think, before either of them could even see it with the naked eye. So I was riding high on my spotting ability and I put the binoculars down shortly after that for a couple seconds to say something to Arnie or make a joke or whatever. And then I'm looking in the oncoming lane. I see a white hood. I'm like, Dave, you should probably back it off a little bit. I think that's a radar lights up. Yeah, I got pulled over once when I was driving in, um, in Texas, man. I don't want to say anything disparaging about this cop because, man, you know, I'm, I'm a cop supporter. Same guy gave me the ticket, might save my wife's life tomorrow, you know, take a bullet for her. But the dude pulled us over. I was going, I don't know, I was going pretty good. But um, Doug spotted the cop just in time. He had instant on. I got slowed down a little bit, and I was only going a few miles over the speed limit, just barely speeding. He let me go because I accidentally, instead of my driver's license, gave him my... Uh, veteran my va card well first off if you if you yeah, i guess we're all going to 3b in this video you see those guys they're clean cut they're professional looking i'm looking like a rag bag and the cop asked me you know how fast you were going you know like they normally do and i just played it off like dude this is this car is amazing man have you ever been in a car like this it's my buddy's car you know and he's letting me drive it and how fast was i going are you sure i was going that fast and i'm looking over from the passenger seat with him talking about how he's he's not used to this fancy fancy man's car and you know not sure how fast sue's going and i'm just trying not to laugh because i'm like this is the biggest load of bs ever but he can pull it off he just let me go he goes uh yeah he uh gave me a warning for i think 97 miles an hour or something like i say doug spotted him just in time to get me slowed down that was the easy part of it after making it through El Paso, Texas and into New Mexico, we ran into what's called the Trucker's Christmas. We started to see a lot of truckers out on the road, which I wasn't expecting. And Simpson, being a former trucker, let us know on this little phenomenon that a lot of truckers would have Christmas morning off to be with their family, but would have to be seven, 800 miles away by Christmas evening the scanner started to get really busy too. And I kind of figured why there were so many cops on the road is because there was constant calls in for erratic drivers and drunk drivers and all sorts of like really erratic drivers. And I heard multiple times on the scanner of people going excessively fast and kept thinking it was us, but it was somebody 20 miles back or 20 miles ahead or whatever. So there was obviously a lot of just shenanigans happening fueled by Christmas spirits. As we entered Arizona, the traffic kept multiplying and now it was raining in Tucson and Phoenix, further slowing us down. And the hopes of getting in within 24 hours or less were starting to dwindle. I couldn't go above 100 miles an hour. I just wasn't comfortable doing it faster than that because I knew the roads were potentially slick. I just 
kept it at 100 because I'm like, I can't lose time, but I know it's not safe to try to make up time. And hopefully Arnie can do his thing on the last stint. With just 250 miles to go, I jumped in the driver's seat for the last stint of the trip. And it's not smooth sailing. You've got a border checkpoint. You got to descend the mountains and get into San Diego and get through there. I'm texting Ed back and forth from the passenger seat. And he's like, come on, you guys got to push it. You guys got to push it. You can still do this. And I'm losing confidence that we're going to make it. But I kept pushing Arnie. And I, I said to him once, I go, hey, like you have to drive faster. I'm like, I know there's cops and stuff out, but we're either gonna not make 24 for one of two reasons, either because you drive fast and you get yanked or because you didn't drive fast enough. And I'm like, which reason do you want it to be? And we were going at a really good clip and about an hour out of San Diego, Doug, unbeknownst to me, actually stopped spotting the potential police threats ahead not wanting to slow me down. He could tell that I was just on a mission to get this done or go down trying. Something just happened and Arnie got a bug up his butt and just turned it on. And it was fantastic because number one, I trusted his driving ability. So I was completely confident. I was like, all right, if it's gonna happen, he's gonna make it happen. I just basically put the binoculars down and stopped looking for cops because I knew I probably couldn't see him anyway. and. I just had to let him do his thing. We're either gonna get tagged or we're not gonna make it. And if I call anything out or have him slow down, then it's just gonna blow his confidence and we're not gonna make it. So I just sat in the passenger seat quietly and enjoyed the ride in. <laughs> and it was a crazy ride in. In between packs of cars, I would just hammer up into the next pack, slow down to pass them, and then just hammer up to the next one, really without regard to possible police that I might be coming up on or not. And there was one spot where I was going at a relatively good clip uh, in between packs of cars and we got a KA blast. And I got the thing slowed down to the speed limit just in time to, for, to have a California Highway Patrol pass by. And this happened a couple more times that somehow, by the grace of God, I did not get uh, a ticket. As we got closer, we were 15 minutes out and I still had 22 miles to go. And it was looking like it was just going to be impossible. But somehow, in between packs of cars, I was able to just weave my way in without affecting anybody, without cutting anyone off. I was able to smoothly get us down to the last stoplight right before Dog Beach. So with just two minutes until the 24-hour mark, I came to the stoplight and there was one car in front of me. Thankfully, nobody was around and there was just enough room to get by this car. So, well, I just made my way around him and we skidded to a stop at Dog Beach at exactly 24 hours and 54 seconds. This was a pretty cool record to break because it's not just going faster than the next guy. It's being the first guys, I mean, the very first guys to ever drive across this great nation of ours in one day when we did it in 24 hours. It was just ocean to ocean, by car, one day. Not only is it the fastest time across country ever, which just makes it easy to talk about because you know there's all these, well, I was the fastest classic car, I was the fastest this, fastest in this race, whatever. No, it's just, we were the fastest people to cross the country in a car, period, in history. And also, between my two tickets, we averaged, I calculated it out by the time and the, the mile marker, we averaged 101.6 miles an hour between one ticket and the other. So, ha. So Brock Yates, the founder of Cannonball, had always said that 30 hours was the wall. So I set out to find out what the wall was for the Atlantic to Pacific transcontinental record. This car is kind of a conglomeration of many cannonball cars that I pillaged. When I was uh, originally figuring out what car would be the ultimate cannonball car, I was torn between two vehicles. One being a Mercedes E63 AMG, 
the other being an Audi S6. The way I had learned about the Audi S6 is we actually had one at AMS as a development car for a short amount of time. And I remarked as soon as I saw the car, just how boring looking the thing is and how much it's shaped and looks like a Ford Taurus. So as we always owned this car, I would always refer to it as the Taurus. It was a pretty capable car. It's got a four liter V8 that lend itself to modification and could make a lot of power and is pretty quick. I drove it probably a few thousand miles uh, while we owned it and I really liked the car. What I liked most about it is how boring and plain it is. Now the reason I didn't build the Audi S6 in the first place was AMS did not offer like a full package for the car. They didn't make turbos for it. They weren't tuning them. It felt right to have a fully alpha packaged AMS built car for the run. So that's why I ended up choosing the Mercedes E63 AMG. Not easy to disguise, but somewhat better performing and touted as an AMS car. So knowing that my friend had this pre-built uh, Audi S6. It's a 2016 Audi S6 with the, it's got the four liter V8 twin turbo. It's got upgraded RS7 turbos. It's got the alpha heat exchanger upgrade on it and uh, they makes about 600 horsepower. So, you know, in a pinch, you know, I needed a car and uh, within an hour, that was probably the best car I was going to find. So I was actually pretty excited about this car because I knew that it would be pretty easy to disguise like a Ford Taurus police interceptor. It really didn't take much to do it because the car is so similar as it is. The full disguise of the car consists of the reshaping of the grill with some white vinyl, reshaping of the headlights with some vinyl. We also took a Ford emblem and I had my guys over at Sticker Dude Designs make me a, an emblem in Ford font that said Audi. And we put that on the grill and that was like the icing on the cake. When this car is coming behind you, it definitely looks like a Taurus police interceptor. In the back of the car, we took some vinyl and kind of reshaped the taillights to look somewhat similar to a Taurus. We debadged the car completely and Doug had this great idea of putting reflective chevrons along the back bumper and then to put a unit number on the back trunk lid to kind of make it look more municipal. So with the body all figured out, our next problem was the wheels. The car came with two sets of 20 inch wheels, both which weren't gonna work because honestly, I really don't like having that thin of a sidewall for a cannonball. So uh, Doug agreed and suggested we find some 19 inch wheels. The thing is with a police car, they're always known for having a black wheel with a silver center cap. So I had to come up with a way to kind of replicate that for our new wheel and tire package. So I called up my guys over at the tire rack and they hooked me up with a set of black OZ Ultra Legera wheels, which I just plastic dipped the center of the wheel silver and it just came out fantastic. We really only had a few days to build this car. I picked the car up on a Tuesday morning and by Tuesday at 12, we were, were busy taking, a, taking the car apart. Probably what we spent the most time on with this car was trying to figure out how to get the brake lights to have a kill switch on them. Audi has a very advanced light system. We got about three quarters of the way, but we were running into a problem where the, it had like a parking light that would slightly illuminate and at night, you know, you would definitely see it. So we ended up having to reprogram the body control computer. We probably had a full day into all that, but we ended up getting it done. Now, as far as electronics go with the short amount of time we had, we actually ended up taking the electronic stack that was in between the seats on the Corvette and simply removing it and putting it in the back seat of the S6 to kind of eliminate the, the whole having to mount electronics and everything else. We ended up pulling my Ford LTD part that I was supposed to take on the C2C Express. So we removed all the countermeasures, the radar detector, the laser diffusers, all the wiring and everything out of that car to transplant into the Audi S6. Now, normally I like to have months, if not a year to prep a car. So I, you know, I wasn't really happy with how it all came out because we've got literally wires taped and zip tied in the car, but we we're able to 
to make it workable. So we had taken the two 20 gallon cells out of the Ford LTD and literally the whole fuel system and transplanted it into the S6, but it didn't end there. My first fill up, I realized that the tanks were very hard to fill. It was like very time consuming because there's really no filler neck. And also the, the caps were like leaking slightly and it became kind of a, a last minute effort. Like, this isn't going to work. We're going to have to do something else. And really the only other option was to somehow see if the E63 fuel cell would fit in the S6. Now the trunk is completely mangled. I can't really even get into the trunk to, to do some final measurements. So we just ripped the trunk lid off there, got the fuel cell out, test fit in it, and it literally fit perfectly except we had to shave off part of the gas cap. Part of the plastic gas cap was kind of catching. So, I mean, it fit like a glove, almost like we designed it for the car. The whole pillaging of other cars is I needed a CB antenna. And during this crisis, you know, it's not real easy to go somewhere and get a CB antenna. So I ended up robbing the CB antenna off the P71 Black Turd from the 2904. So this car is kind of a conglomeration of many cannonball cars that I pillaged. So when I got the car, it was tuned by APR and I couldn't let that happen because a friend of mine, Mitch, owns Dino Spectrum and he's got a new D1 software out there. So he hooked me up with that and it's got the map switching, which was really helpful because I was able to run the 93 maps for the first half of the country and then switch to 91 for the second half. One of the problems we ran into was to mount the thermal camera. On the Mercedes, I used the roof rail where you mount like a ski rack where this car didn't have it. So unfortunately, I ended up having to drill four holes in the roof to mount it. So you know that I'm dedicated when I'm drilling holes in cars. Over the course of a month trying to sort out what car we're gonna use, uh, there was a uh, somewhat large sum of money spent. Thankfully, Doug bought the, the Corvette right and we put it back to stock. So, you know, we probably netted zero there. But with this S6, the way I justified it is, well, I clearly have to replace the E63. So now I got an Audi. So the S6 was set up pretty similar to the E63, although be it not as uh, nicely. Uh, we, we ended up running the ALP laser diffusers we had the same net radar, radar detector, Passport Max 360 mounted on the dash. We had the Uniden 885 bear tracker, police scanner, and CB radio. This time we ended up running a smaller fixed mounted thermal camera that was run off Bluetooth on an iPad. Overall, although the car was not as nicely put together due to time constraints, I actually ended up liking this car better as far as layout goes, as far as screens, it was a lot, I guess a lot nicer for the driver to kind of manage everything. So I was happy about that, even though I'd say overall the car, comparatively speaking to the E63 is 85% of the car that the E63 is. Clearly the E63 is better, but the Audi S6 is good enough. It's a mandatory six-month license suspension. In the C2C Express, the rules are pretty vague, but they want you to have a car that's worth about $3,000. Organized from some crazy Kiwis that came into the U.S. once a year and bought cars before 1980 so they'd be period correct and have them break down across the country. So it sounded like a load of fun. I decided I'm going to get a junkyard LS engine I generally keep the hood closed, so hopefully no Mopar guys will lynch me. So the first person I called was Ed Bullion. After a couple of these things, being fully in the driver's seat, I'm really looking forward to something that's more of an arrive and drive program. I happen to have that situation that I want to offer you. And Forrest was going to come along with us, who had been kind of my countermeasures expert for the record run. I was going to take my favorite car and my favorite theme and do my favorite thing with the record holder of the Cannonball Run, uh, I had to go to the O'Hare Airport in Chicago. Uh, Ed Bullion and Forrest were flying up and we were going to head to Manhattan to the start. 
and then there were going to be about 11 or 12 teams setting off uh, on a Saturday. Unfortunately, there were some pretty serious accidents that befell some of the teams, some breakdowns and uh, some unfortunate calamity that kept several of the teams from starting. But it ended up we were in New York with six different teams to run the C2C Express in 2016. We had a little bit of trouble on the way out. Ed was testing the uh, top speed abilities of the Bluesmobile and uh, we made a, a pretty spirited run in Pennsylvania. Got up to about 120, 125 and, and the car just kept getting louder and louder. Well, it turns out Ed had blown a hole in my muffler from the sustained acceleration. So that was one thing with that uh, we're going to have to fix when we got into uh, New York. Forrest and I headed over to Ivy Tuned. They got the splitter all sorted out, uh, sort of bent back into place. Uh, he found me a muffler shop. We got the car over there. They replaced the mufflers. So we headed into Manhattan to go meet up with Ed, who is now with Alex Roy having coffee. For a Cannonball fan, it was just like a dream come true. I, like I couldn't even believe it was happening. We met at the Gallagher's restaurant in Manhattan, which is a pretty famous place because it's the start point of famous races like the Gumball Rally. It's a real fancy steakhouse, but we enjoyed a nice dinner at Gallagher's and uh, head out to the start. Some of the guys wanted to drive kind of day, night, day, rather than just drive night, day, night, which maximizes the time in which you have fewer other cars on the road. Most teams decided to leave either in the morning or around noon, one o'clock, where Ed and I decided we were going to wait until 8 p.m., kind of when traffic died down, because one of the challenges of Cannonball is getting out of Manhattan. Ed punched the clock at the Red Ball garage and ran down the ramp. I made it about 100 feet before we hit our first stoplight. Make decent time out of the Lincoln Tunnel. We're out in 11 or 12 minutes, which is about the industry standard for such things. Traffic was a little thick in New Jersey, being 8, 9 p.m., but uh, we made our best way we could through it and got into Pennsylvania about 10 p.m. and I was able to really open it up. We got up to about 132 miles an hour on one stretch, which was our top speed of the run, but we did run into a, another problem. There was probably something wrong with the drive shaft or something to that effect, so it really didn't like going much more than about 102 miles an hour. Well, it felt like the car was going to rattle to pieces and we still had another 2,500 miles to go. We pulled off on the side of the road Ed hopped in behind the wheel. I hopped in the back seat to kind of take a break. And I've made it all 2,800 miles of the 2850 run, of the 3205 2904 winning run, with no tickets and really no cop issues. This drive was not that. I took over on my first driving leg, the second leg of the trip, and we're kind of weaving through Pennsylvania, which was under some uh, heavier construction than normal. I, I asked Forrest, who was spotting at that time, I said, is there a cop up there? He looks through the binoculars, looking around, looking at the radar detectors and says, no, it's not. So I roll back into the throttle to immediately have the lights turned on to the cop that was sitting right next to the your speed here sign. Explain to Forrest what a useless human being he is at the moment. And uh, the cop comes up, mentions absolutely nothing of our Blues Brothers motif of the Mission from God sticker across the back of the car, of the fact we're in a 1974 Dodge Monaco Blues Mobile of the fact that uh, we've got endless screens and countermeasures littered across the old dash. Only wanted to talk about the fact that he had clocked me at 90 and a 55. So he takes my license and goes back and he comes back and says, you know what, I understand, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do you guys a favor. I'm gonna write it for 80 and a 55 rather than 90 and a 55. Now I came to find out that you can't find a lawyer in the state of Pennsylvania that will fight much of a speeding ticket, particularly if it is, a, is in a construction zone. But if it's any more than 25 miles per hour over the limit in a construction zone, it's a mandatory six month license suspension. So he did me quite a favor there because that would have been quite a problem even though there isn't reciprocity with Pennsylvania and Georgia. It was about a 12 minute stop and we were back on the road. But now Ed obviously doesn't want to go too fast because, well, if he gets pulled over again, it's probably not going to fare well for us. And I pressed on through Pennsylvania uh, pretty decently. We got into Ohio. We're still running about 100 miles an hour. And we decide we're going to make our first gas stop. And I was a little numb to the speed. And the light rain probably didn't help my traction much. So as I was coming down to the end of the off ramp, there was a stop sign. Well, I get on the brakes and the tires lock up and I'm heading right towards the stop sign. So I'm just about to go off the road and I had a choice to make. I could either try to save 
the car and keep it on the road by easing up off the brakes, or I could let off the brakes and steer to the right of the stop sign and go through a ditch and hope I don't mess up the car too much, or I could crash right into the stop sign. So at the last minute, I let off the brakes just enough to regain traction and I kept the car on the road, I avoided the stop sign, and we just kind of blew through the stop sign and into the gas station. We had it down where Ed would hop out of the driver's seat, put his credit card in the one pump, I would pop out, put my credit card in the pump, pump on the other side, drag the hose around to the fuel cell, and we would fill with two pumps. While well, Forrest went in to use the bathroom and we kind of just rotated around. And the fuel stop takes about, oh, I don't know, about four minutes or so, and we were back on the road with Ed behind the wheel. We start to run into this miserably dense fog, almost impossible to drive through. We could hardly maintain 100 miles an hour. And then disaster struck. It appeared that there had been some sort of rollover accident, and they had completely shut down the westbound lanes. And for 45 minutes, literally, we just sat on the side of the road. Well, I should say, um, Forrest sat around tinkering, Arnie was distraught at the dissolution of his uh, effort to best our time from 2904, and I had a wonderful nap. And I was just devastated because I really wanted to beat the cannonball competition record that Ed had set in 2015 of 32 hours and five minutes, and this 45 minute stop, uh, coupled with the 12 minute stop by the police, were surely going to wreck that. I just simply can't give up. So eventually they opened the highway and uh, the cops got us down to a single file line and ran us through this stop and we're back on the road and heading hard into Illinois. Every time I would be in the back seat to rest, something bad would happen. So we're in Oklahoma, we're in a bluesmobile in September and it's pretty hot. It's about 90 degrees, we're wearing suits and the car has no air conditioning. So I was doing my best to sleep in the back seat. And while I was sleeping, uh, Forrest was driving, Ed was uh, spotting, and they came up upon a Chevy Impala. Well, they were trying to make out if it was actually a police officer, and Forrest decided, well, it doesn't look like a police officer, so I'm going to pass him. So over time, we did pass the cop, but that allowed him, unfortunately, at a very small speed difference, the chance to examine our dashboard. And he decided he wanted to know a little bit about that, and so he cut in behind us and followed us for about another 10 miles, ran our tag, and Forrest was miserably nervous, going about 70.0 miles per hour as much as he could. And I'm like, dude, you gotta go a little bit faster or he's gonna assume we're running drugs. Well, he turned on his lights, Arnie at that point was awake. The cop approached from the passenger side. So I rolled down the window and I said, hi, Mr. Officer, how are you, what are you up to today? And he was kind of taken aback. He's like, well, I just patrolled this area. And, oh, really? Well, where do you go? You know, I know that we're getting close to the state line up here. How much, how much of this is yours? Well, I go here and here. And he starts, like, gets tired of explaining his daily routine to me. And he's like, starts talking about our crime. What are you all up to? Like, well, you know what? We, uh, we're headed out to see some friends. We're kind of doing this little costume thing. And uh, we're going to meet some people in Los Angeles, of all places. He's like, really? That's a long way. He's like, yeah, it is. That ended up kind of calming him down. And uh, he knew we were not up to anything terribly promiscuous. Well, the unfortunate thing was instead of turning around, he just stayed behind us for the next 30 miles or so, kind of slowing us down even more. Forrest and I had run the gas tank pretty low. And I had told these guys, you know, I wasn't sure if there, what was in this factory gas tank and, you know, running a gas tank that's 40 years old down really low, you know, could suck some junk up into the fuel pump and the fuel pump did not sound happy. 140 miles out of Albuquerque, the thing just shuts off. Of course, Arnie is seeing his hopes and dreams of an aspirational time and all of ours at the idea of even, you know, finishing this race just dissolve. You know, how are we going to fix this? It was clear that we were going to not make it to the Portofino. Of course, we're all in suits and ties and drenched in sweat, but uh, Forrest is laying on the side of the road. I don't know how he had changed into some sort of coverall situation, but he looked mu much different at that moment than I'd recognized him a few hours before. So we're getting ready to take this thing apart and it dawns on me, why don't we hit it with a hammer? And channeling his own inner Jeremy Clarkson, Forrest uses that hammer and simply starts laying on the ground, banging against the, uh, the fuel pump. And sure enough, that did the trick. Immediately, the fuel pump kicked back on, turned the key, and it fires. 
and I just lay into the throttle. And uh, we used this ridiculous shifter that came along with the uh, engine swap and uh, got the thing into gear. And I'm like, y'all jump in. In the process, Forrest slams my navigation system in the door jam. We text the group back and let them know that we were back on the road. And John was pretty upset saying, I can't believe that you guys were stopped on the highway, your car broke down, and that you've been pulled over twice, and you're probably still going to beat us. So Ed continued on driving through New Mexico and Arizona, and I took over the wheel as we got into California. At this point, it's the middle of the night, and we're a little delirious. Ed's doing his best to keep me awake and uh, keep me focused. We headed toward Barstow, California, where we were meeting Cannonball motorcycle record holder and Cannonball electric vehicle record holder, Carl Reese. He was leading us in and it was probably quite a sight to see as this red Tesla goes speeding down the highway with a Bluesmobile in tow. And it really became apparent that this was probably the best scenario to have somebody leading us in because by this time we were just beat. So many different highways in Los Angeles, if you've ever been there, it's just a mess of highways going this way and that. And, and clearly we would probably still be out there trying to find the Portofino had it not been for Carl Reese. And our final time was 34 hours and 17 minutes, which ended up being not only the winning time of the C2C Express, but also the fastest time for any antique car in the Cannonball Run. This was going to be the first real cannonball since 1983. The, the stealthiness of just driving as fast as you want to go and just staying out of the sight of the police is, is something that I was always on my mind as you know, I started driving. I would always have the latest radar detector and I would think about just building the ultimate car for cannonball. So in 2006, um, the AMS time attack team had gone out and done the One Lap of America. So when the guys came back from One Lap of America, they actually had a, a, like an underground application to do a cannonball run. So it turned out that Brock Yates was thinking about doing another cannonball. So I immediately applied. I found some drivers. You know, we, we had the idea that we we're gonna do it in a diesel van and we were gonna make a giant fuel cell and try to do it without stopping. Really never heard anything more about it. It turns out the event never happened. I stumbled upon this event called the 2904. It was kind of like the 24 hours of lemons meets the cannonball. You had to buy a car, pay for fuel, pay for repairs, tolls, tickets, everything to cross the country for $2,904, which coincidentally is the distance between New York and San Francisco. In 2015, he decided to do the event one last time, and he was doing it from New York to LA, the classic cannonball route, Red Ball Garage to the Portofino Inn in Redondo Beach. And I just knew I had to do it. Immediately filled out the online application. He responded to me and asked me, are you the same Arnie that has the world's fastest hearse, an 18 van, and a bluesmobile? And I responded, yeah, that's me. He said, well, it looks like you're in the right place. You're in. So we built this Crown Vic, painted it black, and the idea was stealth. We wanted to have a car that looked like a police car to hopefully get people out of our way in the left lane. And also, when we blow past people on the road, they don't call the police because, well, they think they just got passed by a police car. So I had a pretty solid car. I, I, I was going into it knowing that I was probably gonna be the most well-prepared car that the 2904 had ever seen. It had a 55 gallon fuel cell in the trunk that was gravity fed to the factory 19 gallon tank. So I had 74 gallons of gas. I thought, you know what, I'm gonna do some aer aerodynamic modifications. So we made front and rear splitters out of plywood. You know, this car, I was gonna go there and blow their minds. But part of this race, the organizer was saying that there was some cannonball celebrity that was going to show up. And I wondered, you know, well, who could that be? Maybe it was Alex Roy, was it maybe Ed Bullion who, who held the overall cannonball record? Yeah, was it Burt Reynolds? You know, I, I really didn't know. So it's about two weeks before the event. The car is basically fully prepped and you know, I'm just gonna come in here and sweep this thing. Um, 
I'm going to run the first cannonball in, in years, and I'm going to win this thing. And then two weeks before the event, uh, it got revealed who the celebrity cannonball guy was, and that was Ed Bullion. Well, Ed had picked up a 2002 S55 AMG that was, uh, had 11 previous owners, had twice been salvaged. These cars are super expensive to maintain and repair. Well, I mean, brake suspension, everything that's really expensive was outside of the budget. So, I mean, he basically took the rules, dissected them, and built the best car that he possibly could. That's exactly what I thought I had done, but he uh, one-upped me by a lot. So he, he shows up with this uh, blog post that documents in detail everything that he did, how he painstakingly fixed the ignition switch because if you had to replace it, it was going to put him outside a budget, so he, like, he had to take it apart and glue it. And he had this Mercedes technician, uh, like a 30-year veteran of Mercedes that was on his team, who just basically spent a thousand hours rebuilding this car for no money. And he was within the rules. I was sick to my stomach because I thought for sure that there wasn't a chance that anybody was gonna come close to me and I was just going to sweep this event. So when I arrived, there was Ed Bullion there with his S55 AMG. And to me, Ed is like the biggest celebrity. So I, you know, I was thinking that he's gonna have bodyguards and he's not gonna to wanna to talk to anybody because he's such a celebrity. Turns out he's the nicest, uh, most, most down to earth guy there is. Uh, Dave Black, Ed's co-driver from the record run was there in a 2003 Mercedes CLK 430. Uh, they also had another friend of theirs, Dan, who had an Audi A8. They also had another friend, Dave Simpson, with a Lexus SC400. And it really looked like this was going to be the first real cannonball since 1983. So the cars were set to leave in 30-minute intervals. I know Ed Bullion had the pole position uh, at midnight, and that was the ideal time to leave. So I wanted 1230. The organizer... Uh, the way he decides if you, there's two people that want the same start time is Indian leg wrestling. Well, you might know what that is. I, at the time, did not know what it was. Indian leg wrestling has a lot to do about leverage, and Dave Black is quite a bit taller than Miles, and, well, we lost the time. So the next available time slot was 3 in the morning, and I knew that was not good because that was going to put me into L.A. right in rush hour, so I knew I was in trouble. So we left the Red Ball Garage at 2.56 in the morning on Halloween. Turns out that Manhattan is always crazy to get out of, but we did manage to get out of there in 11 minutes. So the, the Crown Vic did pretty good with uh, getting people out of the way. Sometimes people would sit in the left lane because they're scared of what they think is a police car. So, you know, it kind of had, it was a double, double-edged sword. Sometimes it worked really well, sometimes it was a hindrance. So we were making good time in Pennsylvania, and we ended up passing the only other uh, 2904 participant uh, of the event in Pennsylvania, another Crown Vic. We were going along the northern route, so most people were actually taking the southern route because, well, it's a, it's a little bit shorter, and you don't have to deal with the mountains in Colorado, which I didn't think about at the time. And then all of a sudden we got motioned off the road by the police. Apparently they had shut down the road. There was a, a, an accident with a fatality, nothing to do with any of our people. So that was our, our first mishap. That reroute probably cost us about 15 minutes. Through Pennsylvania, the, the sun started to come up. We're averaging, uh, we're pre pretty much going in the, the low 100s, 110, 120 miles an hour. You know, we made really good time uh, going through Ohio. And through Indiana, same thing, Illinois, we, uh, we met with a, a friend of ours who, who came out and kind of paced with us for a while, got some video footage from the outside the car, um, and, you know, continued into Iowa, I was getting into the afternoon, and Iowa's probably the worst state for us, because apparently if you're in the left lane in Iowa in a police car, or what seems to be a police car, pulls behind you, you just squat in the left lane, and that was a little, little painful. Uh, got into Nebraska, a little bit of the same, and that's where we made our first driver's change. So Miles had actually driven from Manhattan to Lincoln, Nebraska. So we did the driver's change and filled up in Lincoln, Nebraska. I was driving and I was on a mission. I knew I had to raise our average speed, which was about 85 miles an hour, and I really wanted to see it at 90. I really wanted to get to LA before uh, morning traffic on Monday, and I knew that I just had to be on it. 
120 miles an hour, just coming up on people. People are getting out of the way because they see what appears to be a police officer in a big hurry. And we were just going for it. So across Nebraska, our average speed was continually rising, 86, 87 miles an hour. And we ran up on some sort of Mercedes and uh, we, we passed by him. And that, I think, kind of upset him because he, I think he was thinking that we were a police officer and we blew past him and then he realized he saw the Illinois plates and saw that we weren't a, an officer. So he decides, well, what do you do when you're angry with somebody on the road? You're going to pass them and you're going to show them. So ends up blowing past us. And we end up having a scout for the next hour or so. We're, we're going 120, 130 miles an hour. And this guy is just going and I'm just hanging back, just kind of uh, enjoying the ride. And, you know, it's time to change drivers and, and get some fuel. And uh, I think we were at an average speed of about 88 miles an hour at that point. So I had raised it up quite a bit. And we head out from the gas station in Colorado. And this is where things start to get dicey and where I realized that I kind of made a mistake taking the northern route because the mountains in Colorado are brutal. We would be going 90, 95 miles an hour when the car would shift into third gear. We would actually lose speed. Well, we had to keep the average speed up as high as we could. So this wasn't going to work. So we floored the Crown Vic up the mountains in second gear as fast as it would go. I thought for sure we were going to blow the thing up. But we made it through the mountains, no problem. Um, smelled a little, little like coolant. I think Utah was probably our fastest state because Utah is a whole lot of nothing. You got an 80 mile an hour speed limit and there ain't nobody in the middle of the night in Utah. So even with a driver change on the side of the road, we ended up with an average speed across Utah of 100 miles an hour. We're at about an 89 mile an hour average, which 89 miles an hour average, that's, I mean, pretty darn close to Alex Roy's. I think he was at uh, 90 miles an hour average on his time of 31 hours, four minutes. Uh, you know, without traffic, we were gonna break 32 hours and seven minutes, which technically is the cannonball competition record uh, that was set in 1983. Of course, Alex Roy and Ed Bullion had beaten that time, but they had solo runs and they could choose exactly what time they wanted to leave. And, you know, it wasn't a competition. So if I could break 32 hours and seven minutes, I would technically be the cannonball run record holder as far as an event goes. Descending into California, Miles was back behind the wheel. Uh, we got, there's a long descent on I-15. Uh, downhill and we just kept it floored the whole way and that's where we hit our terminal velocity of 139.9 miles an hour and that was probably about five minutes of wide open throttle downhill. We lost an hour and a half sitting in rush hour and just to be racing across the country as fast as we could and then to get there just to sit in traffic was just devastating. I just I wanted to jump out of the car. It was, it was horrible. I wanted to turn around. I wanted to go home because I knew that uh, our chances of winning were, were gone. You know, Ed had, had called in at four in the morning. He had a time of 32 hours and five minutes. He had broken the record by two minutes. He now held the cannonball run competition record as well. And I, it didn't look good for us. We ended up getting there at 8.59 in the morning and we had a time of 33 hours and three minutes, which actually is the sixth fastest time of anyone to ever run in a cannonball run competition in a $500 ex-police car, ex-taxi cab with a quarter million miles on it. Ed Bullion had come out to uh, congratulate us. And the first thing out of Ed's mouth, mouth was, you know, if you would have got your start time, you would have beaten us. Holy Nobody in their right mind would May really make an unlimited cannonball these days. Just the, the liability from such a thing would, uh, would really dissuade anyone from doing so. But at the Cannonballers reunion in early January 2020, we found out that there were a few people actually planning to make a run on April 4th. And it 
quickly became a, an unlimited cannonball with no real organizer. When I heard that, naturally, it piqued my curiosity. And my first thought was like, well, I take the E63 out. Wipe the competition off the map, running 27 hours, 25 minutes, having the record, it just, it seemed distasteful. So I quickly said, well, I, I can't do that. That's like bringing a gun to a knife fight. So I said, all right, I'll just go out and scout for some of the teams. I knew a couple of them were going to take the Northern route and I'm close to that. So I figured, well, I'll just run across my home state and get these guys safely through. With this April 4th event coming up, we, we started to hear about this, this virus. And at first it seemed to be like, well, it's just, you know, another one of these flus that they're going to blow out of proportion. And it quickly became apparent that people were taking it a lot more serious than something like that. And states were starting to lock down and they're talking about closing borders and, and everything. And as, as the date grew nearer, you know, states actually started just shutting down. Everyone's calling Ed saying, is this the perfect time to run a cannonball? And, you know, we really didn't know. It wasn't entirely clear whether this was an advantage or not. And it, it really wasn't until I went out on the highway and realized, you know, how fast you could go with no effort and nothing impeding you. On April 4th at 10 p.m., I jumped in the angry Ursula, I picked up a couple of my friends, and we headed out to go meet uh, the two teams. And the two teams that were running was first a guy going for the diesel record and someone who was right behind him about an hour or so was going for the solo record. So I got out on I-80 and I was running out in front of this diesel Passat, which was making unbelievable time. I quickly learned that the traffic on the road was non-existent. There was nothing holding this Passat back, in fact, any time that I would slow down a little bit, he would just catch right back up and I would have to go running out ahead of him again. And it was just glorious. It was absolutely the dream weekend. It started really making my gears turn on, man, what is possible? You know, are these guys going to break 27 hours, 25 minutes? It was really apparent that the lack of traffic and the lack of enforcement was really a huge advantage that, you know, we weren't really sure about. So I had run these guys across the entire state and I figured I would do them a favor. I would pull off on the side of the road and I would get a video of them passing by. So I waited until we got into a very well lit area. We'd just gone through a overpass, very well lit, very safe shoulder. And I pulled off to the side of the road, put on my flashers. We got out of the car and I was walking around the front of the car to kind of line up, get the video camera ready, and they're gonna pass by in probably about a minute or so. And I looked over my shoulder and the semi-truck was coming at about 35, 40 miles an hour, just veering off ever so slightly right towards my car. This all happened so quickly, another second, and I probably would have got hit by my own car. I dove out of the way and the semi-truck plowed into the left rear of my Mercedes just blasting it across the highway. It ends up in the middle of the road. His truck just goes off, careening off into the ditch, gets stuck. It happened so quickly, it was hard to understand exactly what happened. So now with my car in the middle of the road, the semi-truck in, in the ditch, what do we do? I mean, there's nobody out there. I know these guys are coming. So I jump in my car, it's still running. I then pull it off the road. We start clearing debris off the road. By now, a couple of uh, trucks had like slowed down to, because they've seen the calamity. And I see the guys in the diesel Passat and I'm just waving I'm up and down, just waving, just go, 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 because we're all fine. The truck driver's fine. You know, there's no sense in them having them stop. So, so we get them on the way, get the police there. You know, now I'm worrying, am I going to have to explain why the back of my trunk says cannonball world record holder? You know, kind of what's going to happen here? <laughs> so it's kind of a, an interesting situation to be in. When the truck driver came out of his truck and walked over, he was kind of in a daze and it, it was pretty apparent that he had actually fallen asleep at the wheel due to these reduced regulations on the truckers during this whole COVID scare, they eliminated basically any sort of laws 
limiting the amount of hours being driven by these truckers. And this guy had just simply fallen asleep behind the wheel. And lo and behold, my car just happened to be in the one place where he was going off the road. What's interesting about this truck hitting me, though, is, you know, I don't know what would have happened to him had I not been there because, you know, he probably would have went right off the side of the road into the ditch at, you know, 40 miles an hour. The, the first quick look that I had at my car, I knew it was 99% totaled. And I was pretty crushed because if you've done a cannonball on a car, just like Alex Roy has his M5, Ed's got his CL55, and these are cars that they'll never get rid of. You know, there went my car. And just loving Cannonball so much. I plan to keep that car literally forever. You know, people ask, like, would you ever sell that car? And I said, I wouldn't entertain anything less than half a million dollars for that car. So seeing it there totaled and just the thoughts I had had, you know, running in front of these guys, you know, my wheels were already turning. You know, at that point, we still had the record. But I'm just like, man, like, what is possible right now? These guys have, have made it a third of the way across the country, completely unimpeded. No one, no one stopping to check why they were driving. So that's what really, I guess, kind of killed me. Is like, well, now, well, I, I lost my car. Now that uh, I plan on keeping forever, and well, I'm definitely not going out and going to be driving fast. What am I going to take on rallies this this summer? You know, so just pretty bummed about it. The cops were there pretty quickly. They asked me, you know, kind of what I thought. And I'm like, man, just the, the way it all happened, it, it sure seems that this guy fell asleep. And uh, after talking to the guy, you know, they didn't have any suspicion of, uh, you know, impaired driving or anything. And he, he said that he had just taken his eyes off the road, which, yeah, he, I guess he did when he closed them. Thankfully, the cops really didn't take too close of a look at my car. So there was, there was no question about what I was doing out there or why I was on the side of the road. When they asked and what had prompted me to, to be on the side of the road is when we were driving about 20 miles earlier, we smelled what smelled like coolant. You know, I, I kind of know it. I'm like, it's kind of weird. You know, like everything is normal in the car. When we pulled over, that was one of the things I was going to check is that, you know, check if I had a coolant leak or something. So I'd let them know. I said, yeah, I'd smell coolant. I pulled off in this well-lit area to kind of check it out, which was not a lie. I was actually going to do that. And what I later found out is on our way back after my, my buddy's girlfriend came and picked us all up at the towing yard and we're on our way back home at you know, four in the morning, we drove past the same stretch of road and there must be some factory there because it smelled like coolant. So my main concern with having my car at a towing yard out there is someone's going to take a picture of it. And my biggest fear of having any picture leaked of this car is someone was going to think that I was out trying to break a record or, or do something crazy and that I had crashed my car, which I wasn't even in my car when it got hit. So the next morning I had a, a buddy of mine go out with my enclosed trailer and go scoop the car up. You know, the car wasn't there for more than probably eight hours. So we were able to get it secured and in my trailer. I knew that the, the whole insurance thing was going to be a problem because I, I'm sure that they weren't planning to pay for more than a, a car. And I, I, it's definitely been a, a chore to, to work through them. But in the end, I'm, I'm getting pennies on the dollar to replicate this car. It would be very expensive. And with, with what the insurance gave me, I surely cannot replicate it. It is repairable, I think. I don't want to lose my baby, so we're going to we're going to do our hardest to to secure the thing and at least give it a shot. We're running 54 pounds of boost on the stock motor. So in 2005, we started uh, tinkering into time attack uh, at AMS Performance, we needed a good tow vehicle. And uh, from my experience with the AMS team van, the 6.5 liter diesel Chevy van that we had, uh, it wasn't really up to the task. So I went shopping. And this is around the time when diesel performance was in its infancy. Diesel Power Magazine had just come out. I was hooked. I really wanted a 7.3 liter uh, Power Stroke. But now I'm hooked on vans, so I'm not going with an F-350 or an F-250. I'm looking for a van. So I source a van in Virginia. 
a maroon 1999 with a good engine uh, E350 Econoline van. I have a problem where I can't leave anything stock. Uh, at first it was just a tune and a couple things. I got the thing running to about 14 flat with very minimal modifications. We're going to use this van to haul the time attack car, so naturally you don't want to modify it too much. Well, throw that out the window. So I do a stage two turbo, I do stage two injectors. I got this thing running about mid 13 second quarter miles. We're towing our time attack car all over the country in it. I had put a love sack in the back so the crew could chill out. We had a DVD player and this, this thing was a hit with all the guys. I loved to put slicks on it at the drag strip. Uh, and this is 2006 now and just blowing away Mustangs and everything else, you know, mid 13s pretty fast back then, but naturally running mid 13s. Well, like, clearly that's not fast enough for a dependable vehicle that you need to tow your race car. So I went a little farther. At the time I was running about 40 pounds of boost on the stage two turbo. What was holding me back was injectors. So order some stage three injectors and now it's on. I'm going for 12s. So we get these injectors in the thing and man, the thing was so fast. I'm running 54 pounds of boost on the stock motor, really pushing the limit so fast. And it started having some problems. It wouldn't start, it would run kind of funny, and we're, we're chasing injectors and sending them back. What's wrong with these injectors? The injector guy says, no, they're fine. And we're like, no, they're not. So after a few times in and out, we decided to do a compression check. Well, I had 400 PSI in every cylinder, uh, except one, which had 250. So it turns out I had bent a forged connecting rod. This is going to be too much money. Back then it was about $13,000 to build a short block for the, for the power stroke that would hold more power. So needless to say, my quest for a 12 second tow vehicle, reliable to tow our time attack car, went out the window. Ended up putting a stock motor back in it. Probably the best decision I ever made. Left it with a stock turbo and a tune. Enjoyed it for another four or five years. I think there's something wrong with me. Uh, I only like vans that weigh like at least 6,000 pounds. You know, I really always wanted to go 12s in a full-size van for whatever reason that is. And I remember seeing a video from a guy in Las Vegas at the Las Vegas drag strip who had a 2004 GMC Savannah full-size all-wheel drive van. Those vans come with the 5.3 liter LS motor that uh, everybody likes to swap into everything. It's in every pickup truck and everything and they respond really well and hold up to boost really well. So this guy had a genius idea. He would put a, a 72 millimeter turbo Natics turbo, uh, swap the transmission to a 4L80 because the 4L60 is hardly worthy of the stock engine and he would take it out drag racing. So there was this really poorly done video of this thing. Um, it looked like someone had uh, maybe had their 12 year old son make this video. Music dub over was horrible. It was just, it was an awful video for an awesome van. So I said to myself, you know, this, this video of this van does not do it justice. The van ended up popping up on LS1 forum and I knew I had to get it because I have to make a good video fitting for this van. Uh, clearly a wise decision. I flew out to Las Vegas, met the owner, everything checked out. It was, it was perfect because it was an all wheel drive van that hadn't been in the Chicago winters. So it was rust free. That's another thing I can't stand. I always go south when I buy cars or vans. I drove the thing back from Las Vegas, got the thing up to like 140 miles an hour. I think it was rock solid. It also had suspension upgrades, it had 20 inch wheels. Uh, it was really a great van. At the time I ran 13s uh, with uh, eight passenger uh, capacity and uh, you know, it was, a, it was a solid foundation. So I got the thing back to uh, the shop at AMS. Uh, back then I was the vice president. I uh, had the guys kind of go through it and uh, it needed some work. Um, there was, uh, the build quality was not the best. So we sorted the thing out, sorted out the fuel system. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't run the thing less than like half tank of gas because of the, of the fuel slosh on the launch. So we retuned it. Uh, I took it out to the track, uh, brought out my video guys. We we're out testing some other cars anyway. So the thing ended up running 12.4 at 108 miles an hour. Uh, mind you, this is a 6,300 pound van. 
And it was a pretty interesting car to launch. Uh, you would pull up to the line, you would basically put all your pressure on the brake that you could, uh, floor the gas, and just watch the boost creep up, creep up, creep up. I would launch the thing at full boost, 17 pounds of boost uh, on the launch. The thing would cut like one, like high one six, 60 foot, 170, something like that. I think would really, really get down, and it was rock solid. I you know, stock motor. Um, my wife would drive it, uh, you know, hauling the kid around, and uh, I would throw my bicycles in the back of it, and you know, it was a, it was a great all-around vehicle, and uh, you know, it really surprised people. It was hard to get a race uh, with people because uh, you know, guys in Mustangs and stuff uh, aren't exactly out looking for a half-ton van to race. But uh, you know, I did get off a couple races. You know, you open up the open up the cutouts and stand on the brake, floor the gas. And, you know, with a guy standing next, you know, sitting next to you in a Mustang, kind of looking around like, what the hell is about to happen? And just boom, gone. So I had a, had a few stories like that. But uh, you know, I had a lot of fun with the van. Made about 700 horsepower on the stock 5.3, and. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And I still have vans. My wife has a half ton uh, GMC Savannah conversion van and I have a, an 06 Duramax diesel van, which uh, I've got some plans for that. So stay tuned for another VinWiki car story about what I get up to with that. Let's go see how fast we can go in this car. In 1988, my parents bought a brand new Mitsubishi Galant Sigma V6 five-speed. I was 13 years old at the time, and I was just ecstatic about this car because it was pretty fast for the day um, for a sedan. It did zero to 60 in 8.5 seconds, which back then was pretty decently quick. Uh, and this was really the car that started my uh, obsession with Mitsubishi. You know, little did I know that later on I would establish a world-renowned brand uh, revolving around Mitsubishis, but uh, this is the first car that really turned me on to those cars. So I was really awestruck with this car, and I would draw pictures of Mitsubishi symbols, put it in my locker. You know, kids would make fun of me because back then, you know, who knew about Mitsubishi? Nobody. This is pre-Mitsubishi Eclipse, uh, GSX, and all that stuff. But I love this car because it was fast and my dad was a little bit of a hot foot so he would drag race people and, uh, and it was a, a good amount of fun. So as uh, I got a little older, um, I think I was uh, maybe just turning 14, my dad would uh, teach me how to drive on this car. And so on Saturday mornings he would let me drive it to uh, Burger King and we would go and have breakfast together and it was good fun. This is. Uh, this is about 1989 at the time. Uh, probably not the wisest decision to let a 14-year-old drive, but you know, that's what he did. So, uh, enter high school. Um, I started to get a little more ballsy. Uh, at 14 years old, I started taking the car out at night. My parents would always go out to dinner and they would take a long time. And for whatever reason, they would leave the Mitsubishi and drive the Buick Century leaving me the keys, which was a horrible idea. So I started taking out the car and I learned how to power shift and I would, I would go out and just uh, race the car around for 20, 30 minutes, just leaving enough time to get home, let it cool off uh, so they'd be none the wiser. So that went on for quite a bit, probably far too long. Somehow I never got caught. But uh, in 1990, uh, I was 15 years old. I'm getting closer to getting my driver's license, but my best friend, Martin, had gotten his driver's license. He was a year ahead of me. And uh, one night, my parents went out, as usual, in the Buick Century, and they left the keys to the Mitsubishi Galant Sigma. So I called up Martin. I said, hey, Martin, let's go see how fast we can go in this car. There was a long stretch of um, two-lane highway uh, called Northwest Highway, Route 14 uh, in Mount Prospect, Illinois, where I grew up. So we decided to take the car out and we're gonna go see how fast we could go on this stretch of road. Now, it's probably, uh, where we started is probably about a mile or so, maybe, maybe a little less. 
First things first though, we go check where the cop always sits, uh, kind of at the end, make sure that there's no cop there. So we, we roll down there, no cop, fantastic. Turn the car around, drive back to the, uh, the stoplight, make a UE, and we go for it. And Martin is driving, he's just rowing the gears, first, second, third, fourth, and we're just, we're going for it. And, uh, you know, I felt a little safer. My dad had a radar detector in the car, so we knew we were, you know, if there was a cop, we'd, we'd probably hear it and we'd checked, you know, this is, uh, this is foolproof. What could possibly go wrong? So we, we passed the 100 mile mark and uh, we're getting towards the end where the cop sits normally. Well, lo and behold, the radar detector gets pinned and what seems like an eternity, I can still picture it to this day, just looking at that red, the red and blue lights on the roof and the black and white Mount Prospect police car that just clocked us at 105 miles an hour. I swear I could see the whites in his eyes and we blow past this cop at 105. So uh, maybe it would have been smarter to keep your foot in it, but you know, we're not very smart. So we immediately hammer the brakes and it takes us probably a, a block to get this thing slowed down and there's a hard right turn and we take that turn, hard right turn, hard left turn. I mean, we're, we're driving this thing. I mean, I'm surprised the, the wheels didn't come off. Uh, we're, we're probably, the tires were probably folded over. I wouldn't be surprised if we, we curbed the wheels. We're, we're on it so hard. So we ditch into this neighborhood and we're just blasting through this neighborhood. Turn off the lights, you know, making a right turn, left turn, just trying to th throw this cop off. And, you know, we, we only saw like a glimpse of his blue and red lights one time in this neighborhood and somehow we got away. So we get the car back to my, my parents' house, park it in the driveway, and now, I mean, the brakes are on fire. The car is just like steaming hot. I mean, there's, if my parents came home at this point, like it would be a dead giveaway that the, we were just out doing something. And you know, being 15, 16 year old kids, we're like, what if he got the license plate? So we are freaking out. So. My thought is like, well, I can't pull the car in the driveway so, or in the garage, so let's leave it in the driveway. We got to get the smell out of the car anyway. Uh, let's wash the car. So I'm washing the car, you know, and this is maybe not too abnormal because I really cared about these cars. My parents knew that. So I would, I would wash the cars on occasion. So I'm out there washing the car, trying to cool off the wheels, try to get the smell of the brakes to go away. And around the corner, I see the Buick Century pulling up. Martin is still there. He dives in the bushes and runs, runs home back, uh, back in the neighborhood to go home to leave me to uh, explain why the brakes are smelling. And uh, my parents pulled in, the, pulled in the driveway, pulled in the garage, um, kind of said, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm just, you know, just felt like washing the car. Oh, okay. My mom went inside. My dad stayed out in the garage, had a cigarette. Um, Kind of said, okay, I'm going to go in. So he went in the house. Uh, I finished washing the car and uh, kind of letting the thing air out. I pulled it in the garage, not knowing what I was going to walk into, but uh, I walked back in the house and my parents were none the wiser. And in fact, they still don't know to this day at 42 years old that I did this. But uh, what makes it uh, even greater is I still own the car. Um, after it was my father's car, it became my car um, in my later years in high school once I had a driver's license. Um, I had the car at the beginning of college. Um, I bought brand new uh, BBS Moda wheels uh, back in 1994 for the car. Uh, I got 15 inch because I couldn't afford the 16 inch tires, but uh, I've still got the car. Um, I've fully restored it. It's, it's right back in its former glory. I've got an old school stereo in it, and it's just the way it was when I was in high school. Fully rebuilt from engine, the transmission and everything. And I, you know, when I was rebuilding this car, so many of my guys at AMS were saying like, let's put a 4G63 in it from a Mitsubishi Eclipse. And uh, we could, you know, put, put it up to 500 horsepower, all this. And I said, I am leaving it stock because when I drive this car, I wanna feel like I'm 16 years old again. And that's exactly what I did.
Hi, I'm Brock Gage Jr. My father invented the cannonball in 1971, and I was on the first one with him, Jim Williams, Steve Smith, where we set the record in 40 hours and 51 minutes. Later that same year, Brock and Dan Gurney reset the record. And now, after many other attempts, we have a new record. Congratulations to Doug and Arnie. Great job. Don't know how you did it. Good God, I don't know how you did it. In 75, Jack May and Rick Klein improved the record to 35 hours, 53 minutes. I'm David Yarborough. In 1979, Dave Hines and I set the record at 32 hours and 51 minutes in the fifth and final Cannonball Run. Congratulations, Doug and Arnie. In 1983, David Deem and Doug Turner set the record. In 2006, Alex Roy and I broke that record. In 2007, we announced the news. Congratulations to Doug and Arnie. Well done, boys. Hey, Doug and Arnie, congrats on setting the Cannonball record. That is an insane achievement, and I know how hard it is. Richard and I did it in 2007. Enjoy it. I'm David Black, and in 2013, I set the Cannonball record with Ed Bolian and Dan Wong. Congratulations, Arnie and Doug. To me, cannonballing is the ultimate expression of freedom. And it's something that, as a kid, I saw the movie, I read the articles, and it was something that just was forever in my mind, which uh, it really didn't come back until 2006 when, with AMS, we had gone and done the One Lap of America, which is the event that uh, Brock Yates kind of turned Cannonball into once he stopped doing the, the cross-country runs. And he actually sent out a application for an underground one last cannonball and the guys brought it back and they're like, oh, you know, you like cannonball stuff, you know, check this out. And I was just beside myself, like, here is an application to do a cannonball. I immediately filled it out, picked my team members, picked out a, a, a vehicle that I was going to do it in, sent in the application and never heard anything. Well, that's because uh, Brock probably had a better idea of not doing it. So uh, it actually never happened. But then after that, in 2007, Alex Roy comes out that he had broken the record and the movie 32 Hours, 7 Minutes comes out. And now I am just fiending for any amount of content about Cannonball that I can find, but there really just isn't any. And in 2013, Ed broke the record, 28 hours and 50 minutes, 98 miles an hour across the whole country. And I was both excited and gutted because excited because I was going to hear more about Cannonball. Someone else has done it, hear about the car, hear about the strategy, but gutted in the fact that like, how do you beat that? It's, it's pretty much unbeatable at that point. Don't just meet your heroes, beat your heroes. So that was what I set out to do. I wanted to best Alex and Ed and the Daves and drive faster than them across country, but it was a long journey to get there. After having done the C to C race, and learning kind of how to do cannonball and what it really took to do a race and uh, doing it with my first team, uh, Matt and Donadell, without whom I would not have gotten to this point. I learned what it really took to beat a record. And in that time frame, Ed uh, asked me to come down along with his friend Arnie Toman to uh, film some stories at his cold, loud warehouse studio, the early days of VinWiki. And I was like, man, who is this Arnie guy? And so I like Facebook stalked him and read this article about him winning the 2904. And I see all these pictures of him in like shake and bake outfits with this Lamborghini and uh, Bluesmobile and Bandit Trans Am and all these different like crazy cars. I'm like in costumes. I'm like, this guy is either like the coolest guy ever or just a giant tool that's full of himself. Thankfully, the former was true. Uh, I quickly found a bond uh, with him and um, we started talking all things Cannonball. And it became apparent that he was probably the uh, greatest contender to my dreams of breaking any record. So I thought, well, if you can't beat him, join him. So the car I chose was a 2015 Mercedes-Benz E63 AMG. And the reason I chose this car is, of course, the performance, the braking, the handling of the car, but also that the car can be kind of disguised into something that uh, looks like every other silver vehicle out there on the road. Clearly, Ed was onto something choosing an AMG. 
For the fuel cell, we ended up with a 45 gallon capacity coupled with the 21 gallon factory tank. So we looked at Alex's design, Ed's design, everything we had seen in the 2904 and C2C Express and came up with the best possible fuel transfer system we could. Most people think that the way to break a record is to stop for fuel as little as possible. And while I agree, uh, my strategy is more to be stopped as little as possible. So I pushed Arnie hard for a four stop plan, uh, even though that seemed counterintuitive, but I, we had gotten our stops in my Monte Carlo down to about four, four and a half minutes, and they were very well orchestrated. So the car was outfitted with a uh, Alpha 9 package. Um, I'm the former VP and co-founder of AMS. Uh, I figured it was fitting that I use their parts. I know, I know that uh, they can be trusted and they're reliable, but the car was detuned down to 700 wheel horsepower just for safety's sake. But uh, I figured that was plenty enough to get the job done. As far as countermeasures go, we went with the AL Priority Laser Jammer, uh, Net Radar, Radar Detector, Passport Max 360, had a police scanner, CB radio, plane crash avoidance system, and brake and tail light kill switches. Something new though that we're trying is a thermal scope mounted on a gimbal on the roof. And this has never been done before, and I'm guessing I found out why because it's really sort of temperamental and uh, requires a lot of babysitting to kind of make it work. Even if you gave me a half million dollars, I would still go the exact route that I did. Simply, you can't get a better car uh, for this type of thing, in my opinion. And I think we've went out and proved that. With me as Arnie's co-driver, the uh, debate was on for the third man because you, you gotta have a good spotter to make this all work. So basically getting roped into Cannonball was uh, not by choice uh, to start out with, um, though it was a pleasure. A little while back, a few months ago, uh, Doug gave me a call saying basically, hey, I'm, uh, I'm going on a rally and uh, I need a spotter and I was wondering if you wanted to come and it's tomorrow and it's for a week. And I was like, sure, count me in. Sounds good. A few months later, Doug called me up again and said, hey, I've got a proposition for you. Um, we're doing a C to C run in a Monte Carlo. And I was wondering if you wanted a spot and I've got be our third first being Doug and Arnie being the second. I said, of course I'm, I'm in happy to help any way I can. So I uh, hopped in the car and, and did some spotting there and made some good time. And then unfortunately broke down in Colorado, but kind of got a feel for what it's like being in the car for 15 hours at that point. But as I, as the day neared and we, uh, we started to really get into the nitty gritty of, of learning all the police and learning all the locations and all that. I really had a great time just, just figuring it all out. And, uh, Doug was really instrumental in helping me learn all this stuff. And, and Arnie built an insanely uh, amazing car that handled ex way better than I could have ever imagined. In 2019 on the C2C, we took the same route we were planning to take. And I shrewdly negotiated a bunch of teammates slash competitors into running the same route with us. And so I, that I could use them for reconnaissance. And they were very helpful in that regard. One of my friends, Dan Doucette, programmed the scanners for us and um, did a lot of research on weather. So there's a, a lot of people involved that really helped us out without which we couldn't do this. The other aspect of planning was assembling a good team of spotters that were cannonball friendly and also qualified. Both Arnie and I had friends in numerous regions of the country, thanks to our respective businesses. So we were able to assemble a team of probably about 20 spotters across the country and some spots like Ohio and Illinois and Colorado, we just had covered almost end to end and it worked out really, really well. There's so many variables, most of them you can't control. You can't control how many police are happening to, to patrol or uh, whether or not they're hiding with a radar on or off or, or things like that. So you have to focus on the variables that you can control, like, weather. As silly as that sounds, weather was one of the things we could sort of predict at least a few days in advance. It literally came down to about two days before that we had planned to take the southern route and the weather turned in our favor on the northern route. So we decided to uh, take that as that was our original preferred route based on all of our research and it worked out 
beautifully, not a single drop of rain on the whole drive. So the drive itself was not without adventure. Once we got on the road, it was just go time. Uh, we made incredible time across the eastern third of the drive. And we encountered a variable that we hadn't planned for, and that was deer. And uh, I guess Arnie and I are both not hunters because that didn't even cross our minds that it was hunting season. I think we saw probably 50 deer dead on the highway during our drive. So Doug did an amazing job on the first uh, 500 miles of the run. We had uh, a great average speed and we got to our first fuel stop. And I ran into a situation that uh, had not occurred to, uh, on a cannibal before where we ran into the bathroom, came back out and I was removing the thermal camera and I had to open up the rear passenger door and I knocked the gas pump out of the car. Well, it kept pumping and it pumped gas all over my right foot. So it looked like I was gonna be doing the rest of the cannonball with one shoe. So, you know, Arnie always makes fun of me for packing too heavy for cannonball trips, and he was making fun of me for taking two pairs of shoes on uh, the last run. But, uh, you know, I always have to carry an extra pair of shoes just in case, you know, we roll through uh, a good neighborhood. And, ah, he wasn't making fun of me after he spilled, uh, spilled fuel on his shoe. No, wasn't making fun of me then. Ohio was amazing. We had uh, about five different spotters and the best thing I ever did was put them all in a group text. So they started getting competitive about how fast they were going to go and how far they were going to lead us. And they went out and bought CB radios and radar detectors. And it was like we had a mini cannonball almost on our hands through Ohio. We were uh, pretty much uh, free of any law enforcement intervention. We did have uh, one scare in Ohio and a cop was sitting in the median looking the other way and we rolled by him at, at triple digits and thankfully he was looking the other way. So one of the things you run into on a cannonball is you have to be kind of aware of who you're running up on. And in one of the Midwestern states on my shift, I came up pretty hot behind a Dodge Charger. Uh, we identified it as a charger and I had kind of had to creep up to it and we sure enough it was a, a state trooper. So we were stuck behind him for a while. Thankfully he got off the highway. Luckily we were paying attention because he got right back on because I'm sure he wanted to see what we were all about. So he ended up pacing us for a while and probably cost us about 20 minutes or so before he decided to turn off. The crazy thing is on our drive across country Somebody did get pulled over for 130 miles an hour, but it wasn't us. It was one of our spotters. And it wasn't even while they were spotting for us. It was while they were en route to Dan's house to like meet up for the spotting. And they were doing 130 in my hometown, actually. And uh, they talked their way out of the ticket by pretending that the car was acting up. And it was a Ferrari, so that was believable. Then in, uh, I think it was Iowa, we got called in and Arnie's disguise of the car paid off because we hear over the scanner, we have reports of a silver passenger car westbound at high rate of speed. And I'm like, <laughs> passenger car, <laughs> I have no idea what it is. So that, uh, that certainly helped. So what I did was I covered all of the carbon fiber trim, parts of the taillights with silver vinyl. I painted the red calipers gray and took all the emblems and stuff off. So you really can't tell what it is. And what I ended up with is from the back, the thing looks like a 2000s Accord. Now our, our average speed to the Mississippi we'll say was absolutely phenomenal. And everybody in history that has never done cannonball thinks that you can just keep that up the whole way, or you make up all your time in the Western half of the, the U S and everybody that has done cannonball says you have to make up all your time in the Eastern part of it. That certainly is true. You bank all your time in the first thousand miles of the drive, and then you just watch it wither away, watch your average speed dwindle down the rest of the drive. We had one little incident in uh, one of the Midwestern states, and we spotted a cop a little bit too late, and he uh, instant on radared us. And 
I don't know how fast we were going, but I think it was around 120. We're just like looking in the rear view mirror, waiting for him to come through the median and never came. So we're like, okay, let's, let's go. Arnie's like, man, are you going to run? I'm like, I'm not running. He, he didn't come through the median. So we called our spotter who we had just passed and asked him if he had seen a cop come back westbound. He goes, no, I'm at the gas station. He's next to me. His radio is going crazy, though. <laughs> so shortly after that, we saw another state trooper come like flying through the median and kind of set up to look uh, our way. But we were we did the Alex Roy kind of unintentionally. We, we were tucked in behind a tractor trailer as we passed him. And so he didn't even see us. You know, I, I don't know if he was actually looking for us, but it certainly makes a good story that he was setting up to, to catch us, you know, and, and we snuck by. So I knew Nebraska was going to be a tough state. They use a lot of instant on radar. So I called up my buddy, uh, Kyle Loftus of 1320 fame, and he just went above and beyond. He hooked me up with someone in every major city. We had five spotters and he actually had a sign made for the back of his truck that said 2850 or bust. And it was, it was great to have him out on the road and all of his friends, and they were able to kind of save us some trouble along the way. For our third fuel stop in Denver, we had a pit crew in the form of my friend Schiller from I Crave Boost. And he was there at our gas stop and realized that the pumps were actually shut down. So he was able to scout out a, an alternative, which was on the other side of the highway. But as we pulled up, he had both fuel nozzles in hand and ready to go. And it was a huge help to just be able to run out, use the bathroom. He, he gave us water and I was able to get the thermal camera set back up for the night shift. Overall, it was an incredibly emotional journey. So even getting to the cannonball was very emotional. Um, I had two breakdowns in the Monte Carlo in separate cannonballs. So I just didn't finish, or I guess one we finished in a rental car. Even building a car and getting to the start line is an incredibly difficult journey, fraught with financial peril. And even the win I had in 2018, we were broken down probably three different times and we finished without one exhaust and you know, no AC and just waiting for something else to break. And, and somehow we rolled in, but it was, you know, not without extreme emotion. This drive was kind of the culmination of that, you know, of, of a lot of things that I've tried to accomplish in my life where I set out to be the best at something, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm moderately good. I'm a big fish in a small pond. We'll say at a lot of different things, but have never excelled at one. And that's always bothered me. And so this was uh, kind of that chance to go after something that I could say, I am one of the best ever at this. The tough thing is it can be taken away from you at any time by something outside of your control. We almost experienced that in Colorado. The car just started bucking uncontrollably, losing power. And I just I mean, the same feelings came right back to me of what had happened with the Monty three different times. And I'm like, all right, we're done. I texted my wife, I texted Ed, and you know, we're just like, all right, we rolled off an exit, shut it down, and I'm like, okay, we gotta find uh, some way home for us from middle of nowhere, Colorado. And Arnie shut the car down, started it back up again, everything was fine, and we kept going. And it turns out that it was all due to 91 octane and the car was tuned for 93, but that was not available at our last gas stop. And so the uh, ignition was detonating and uh, we were not running on full power. So Arnie said he'd take it easy. What that meant was, uh, I'll quote Dan Gurney, at no point did we then exceed 175 miles an hour. That was his definition of taking it easy. So when we entered California, we had a uh, friend, Carl Reese, who was the former Cannonball motorcycle record holder, who was going to meet us out in Barstow and kind of lead us into LA because at the end of this, you're, you're, getting, you're getting kind of tired. And it's just nice to have someone in front of you. So you don't have to make uh, decisions on what road you're taking and everything. But he was so early, he decided to come on out to near the border of Baker. And he was just going to run us between Baker and Barstow. 
on his uh, BMW motorcycle. Now, what's interesting about this motorcycle is he's got these crazy like high beam lights and he's on the phone on his headset and he says, okay, I'm just gonna run in front of you and I'm gonna flash people out of the left lane so we can just kind of kind of pass through, which is kind of a dicey uh, proposition because, you know, this is kind of wreaking a little bit of havoc. And, you know, I could see someone, you know, calling calling in this motorcycle flashing lights and this silver passenger car, you know, with antennas flying in behind. And, you know, some of the time it worked, it got some people out of the way, but other times people are just, just parked in the left lane. We got off the exit to Redondo Beach and just pretty much got green lights all the way there. And we pulled in without any fanfare whatsoever, 27 hours, 25 minutes. We didn't quite hit the goal that I wanted. I was, I was hoping to get in in the high 26 hours, but I, I thought that it was really cool that we were able to break that 100 mile an hour overall average barrier. And what we ended up with was 103.1 miles per hour for 2,825 miles. Congrats, Arnie. Congrats, Doug. Uh, it's a massive uh, achievement. Uh, you've beaten 2,850. I wish I had done it, but uh, I will have to go back. Arnie, Doug, you guys are legends. What an amazing drive. The perfect mix of talent, luck, the right people, the right machine, and the right time. Arnie, Doug. Congratulations, that was a great, great effort. Well, I wish I was there right now to uh, congratulate you personally, but uh, congratulations Arnie and Doug for uh, beating the record that most of us didn't think could be beaten. First, I want to say to Ed Bolian, my condolences. But records were made to be broken. So, my hearty congratulations to Arnie and Doug on a tremendous feat of endurance and efficiency and maybe a wee bit of speed. But remember, Records were made to be broken. Huh? We're coming for you. Guys, guys, watch out. I just got my doors blown off by a cop car heading to California. When the lockdown came, Honestly, I just wanted to go out and drive, not only because the roads were empty, but also because people said, well, you shouldn't do that. It's unsafe. I promised my wife that I wouldn't do any more cannonballing after 2725. And I stuck to that promise, but I was certainly begging because I had been on a number of uh, essential trips and I saw how empty the roads were and just how much joy it brought me to drive when there was nobody else on the road and nobody hogging the left lane. It was like all of the Karens had stayed home and they were the same people who sit and park in the left lane and never, never move over. So it was a truly awesome experience being out on the road and just driving fast everywhere. So I got to watch two other teams make runs, the ones that I had helped scout, and both of them were in imminent danger of taking our record. And it was certainly a, a little bit of a stressful time, very emotional time for me. I wanted to see somebody that I knew and respected carry the torch, take the record, but I certainly didn't want it to happen that quickly. Those two guys didn't end up beating the record. So I was able to, to go to sleep that Sunday night. Uh, but then we got a message that somebody else that we had never heard of was closing in on our record and, and was about to beat it. And they certainly did. Um, some of you heard about the, the 2638 story and the, the borrowed Audi. And it was certainly hard to accept that that was how it had gone down. Just because there was no traffic and no cops, somebody jumped in a car and went out and beat our time, especially after we had spent so much time and effort and poured emotion and years of planning into to beating Ed's record. So after my Mercedes got wrecked on April 4th, I was pretty heartbroken, uh, but I did think that maybe God was telling me, like, you're kind of done with this whole cannonball thing. Just when I thought that I had uh, come to grips and made my peace with being retired and just seeing the record go away, my wife sends me a text message. And she essentially said, who am I to impose my ethics on you if you were doing this with a clear conscience? And I think this actually is safe to do 
when there's nobody else on the road and I don't like how you kind of lost the record. And if you want to make a run during the quarantine, you have my blessing. And I'm like, great. Now you say it. I can't call your bluff. Arnie's car got wrecked. What the heck am I going to do now? So I called up Arnie and said, all right, I've got permission. How are we going to come up with a car as traffic is starting to mount? People are not following the whole quarantine thing. So we had to do something quick. And the quickest alternative was Troy's Corvette that he had run in the Cannonball a couple times. And Doug bought it. So he sends it to me to kind of go through it and make sure that it's ready to go. We had about a week's worth of work we had to do to it. Uh, I took the car out on the Monday before we were supposed to go and realized that there is no way that I'm driving this fiberglass sports car across the country at those speeds. I just It just didn't feel right and I knew I had to go back to the German sedan. So I knew that my buddy Eric had this Audi S6 that had some mild work done to it that he had promised that he would sell me when he was done with it. So I called him on Tuesday morning and I said, Eric, I got to level with you. I need to make another run. My Mercedes is wrecked and I need to buy your car. And he's like, well, you're in luck. I just bought a GTR and I'm looking to sell it. I said, I'll be there in 30 minutes. So I picked the thing up at noon on Tuesday and the three day cannonball build began. In cannonball, my favorite part is building the car and preparing which in this circumstance, we're both out the window. So the build of this car was gonna be like a reality show where you build it in a few days. But in this reality show, we were actually going to build it in a few days. So the car is a hodgepodge of cannonball cars that I had. We stripped all of the countermeasures off my Ford LTD that we were gonna run in the C2C Express in 2019. We robbed the fuel system out of the E63. We took the electronic stack out of the Corvettes. We took the CB antenna and a couple other odds and ends off of my Crown Vic from the 2904. And in a few days, we had ourselves a cannonball car. So what's funny about the Audi S6 is it was actually the car that I wanted to build in the first place before the Mercedes. But seeing that AMS did not have a bunch of parts for the S6 like they did the E63, I wanted to run a full alpha packaged car. And at the time they didn't do tuning and really only had a couple parts. So that's why I chose the E63. But the reason I wanted to do the S6 is it can kind of be disguised as a Ford Taurus. So seeing we were pretty late in the whole quarantine thing, we are already into May. The traffic was already really picked up and really the only advantage we were gonna have would be leaving Manhattan at any time we wanted. So the plan was to leave at 6 p.m and get through Denver uh, before 8 a.m. the next morning. Here we go to New York. I called in uh, my former co-driver, Dunadell, who ran with me in the C2C and Ultra Beige and helped me win the 2018 run uh, because Berkeley was unavailable and Dunadell was absolutely ready to go, waiting for the call. My cannonball story started uh, in about middle school when I read about Alex Roy's record and then progressed when uh, Ed's record broke in 2013. I remember vividly meeting uh, Doug Tabbitt at a Cars and Coffee in Cleveland. It was uh, July 4th, if I remember correctly. And uh, essentially we were drawn to each other by both of us having antennas and screens in our cars. My GLI and his Corvette were both very reminiscent of, of vehicles we had seen and looked up to, you know, Alex's M5 and Ed's CL, all vehicles that we, uh, you know, strive to, to emulate almost. Doug and I became fast friends and maintained a good friendship over the past next couple of years. And it really blossomed when Doug tapped me to be his co-driver in the Monte Carlo, now dubbed Ultra Beige, for the 2017 C2C Express. Of course, that run ended rather haphazardly in Indiana on the side of the road at a transmission shop of all places. And then we progressed to 2018, of course, finishing, also heartbreaking, but still winning uh, in Ultra Beige. And then moving on to 2019, Unfortunately, when Doug and Arnie were looking for a third co-pilot, uh, I was unable to make it. I was starting a job that week, and I decided to, you know, pass the torch, and and uh, and I gave the opportunity. Which, of course, the 2019 C2C became a trial run for the 2725 run later that year in the E63. So as soon as I heard that Doug, Arnie, and Berkeley had set the record, I was ecstatic. But also, a part of me was had a little bit of a heartstring pull. 
And I felt that, you know, the next opportunity I got to, you know, if anything ever happened, I would be lining up at, at Doug's door and Arnie's door to be the third man. And lo and behold, as soon as 2638 came out, I remember calling Doug and said, when are we going? When are we going? And he sort of said, well, I've got to talk to my wife and whatnot. A few days later, I got the call and, and we, were, we were headed to New York. And it was eerie in New York City because there's no cars, but there was people and bikes everywhere. And the, the new risk was driving through an intersection, even if you had a green light, you might have bicyclists just running the red lights. It was like, there was, there was no traffic laws anymore. You know, cars didn't have the right of way. So that presented a, a new challenge. But because of the lack of traffic, we were able to make it out of Manhattan in four and a half minutes and got stuck at one red light. And that annoyed us, which is crazy because usually Manhattan is just, you're stopped all the way out. So we quickly got up to speed and we're on the way. Honestly, it almost felt too easy. Like it, it didn't even feel like this was even gonna count because up to then we had you know no problems at all. We had an incredible team of scouts lined up that had our backs that wanted to see us get the record. And that helped us out in Pennsylvania because we came up on two PA state troopers in short succession. And thankfully we had just passed one of our scouts so we called them and said, hey, we need you to come take one for the team because we had no idea how long we might be stuck behind them. And so he came flying up and got ready to pass one of them and the trooper got off at the exit. So we took off again, five minutes later, get stuck behind another one. Call him up, hey, it's your time. So he comes flying up and gets ready to pass him again and he turns around in the median. So thankfully we didn't have to pay his ticket for him, but uh, we were able to continue on and, and not get stuck behind the, the troopers for a while because that can certainly take a lot of time off. So across the Midwest, we were hauling. That, that was where we had a couple of 125 mile an hour averages across multiple states and we were able to get our average to Denver up to 120, which is exactly where we needed to be to be sub 26 hours. So one of the biggest problems with this car is at 160 miles an hour, there's this crazy like air buffeting, like whining noise that I, you just can't drive faster than that or otherwise it'll drive you crazy. So that definitely kept our top speed down. So at no point did we exceed 175 miles an hour. We got to about Iowa, had a hiccup. I, I honestly thought we were done. I had wanted to get Michelin Pilot 4S tires, but they were on back order. So we settled on the Continental Extreme DWS, which was a great idea if we had done the run in April, but we were in May now and it was super hot out. And so they were a little bit spongy for performance driving in warm weather. All of a sudden the car was just like super vague and almost uncontrollable. I'd, I'd like turn the wheel to, to change lanes and I'd turn back and there'd be like a delay. And then there was this vibration in the front end and it was just, it was all over the board. And I'm like, I mean, it's gotta be tires. It feels like tires that have just gone completely to crap. Or like when you overheat your tires on the track and they're done the heat cycle and they're just like, you're just all over the board. That's what it felt like. And I'm like, there's no way these tires are that bad, but maybe, maybe that's it. That's gotta be it. Arnie was asleep in the back. And I told Dunnadell, I'm like, I, I think we just gotta like try to let some air out of the tires. Like maybe that'll help give us a little more grip. But in the back of my mind, I'm going, this is crazy. If, if they're this shot already, we're never gonna make it through the mountain pass. I mean, we're like 1200 miles into the run. My gut just sank because I'm like, we're done. This is not gonna work. This is a Band-Aid. And Arnie woke up and he's like, what the heck is going on? Why are you going 60 miles an hour? I'm like, this car is awful. It's got a mind of its own. And I literally just like took the wheel and did this and just kind of like threw the car and it did this. It went back and forth both directions. He's like, man, that's crazy. What is wrong? And I'm like, I have no freaking idea. This car is driving itself. And he's like, wait a minute. Do you have the, uh, the like lane change assist thing on? I'm like, I don't know. What's that? And he's like, there's, there's an icon on the dash. It like has the, the two lanes. I'm like, yeah, that's on. He's like, you moron. That's what the vibration is. Every time you get to the, the lanes, it's giving you a vibration. It's trying to put you back into the lane. I'm like, oh my goodness. So it took us probably 10 minutes to try to figure out how to turn this darn thing off. And we finally got it turned off and we're on our way. But that was our big moment of like, 
we're done. This ain't going to happen. And it was all just to my idiocy and lack of understanding with technology because the newest car I own is a 2000 Mercedes and has heated seats and rain sensing wipers. Ooh. So to me in cannonballing, the most important thing is safety. And just like the 2725 run, we weren't passing people at excessive speeds. There was no passing on the shoulder. And a lot of people are, are dumbfounded. You know, they, they think it's like the movies, like it's a, a real life Dukes of Hazard or something. Uh, which it's far less dramatic than that. And given the less traffic, it was uh, it was quite a bit easier. Arnie is a master of disguise. The E63 was awesome. The S6 was awesomer because it sort of looked like a patrol car. However, I'm not sure which was a better disguise because the E63 became known as the silver passenger car because that's what was described over the scanner when we got called in in Iowa. Perfect. Could be anybody. However... The S6, while it probably kept us from getting called in multiple times because people mistook it for a police car, it bit us when we got called in in Colorado because the person was incredibly descriptive and even called out the unit number and all of the, he knew it was an Audi dressed up to look like a patrol car and that's what came over the scanner. So we're like, well, there's no mistaking that they are looking for us. So Arnie's driving, I'm frantically looking for a way around because we heard the cop report back and he goes, yeah, I'm at M4 such and such. I'll, I'll be waiting for him. So I'm going, all right, we got to get off on surface streets. There's like 13 miles to the border of Utah. So let's just take surface streets to get around this and, and get there. So I'm looking at the map. I'm trying to figure out where the cop said he was going to be. And I finally realized that, you know, when they called us in, they reported us at mile marker 18. We were moving so quickly that by the time it came over the scanner transmission, we were at mile marker 13, and we had already passed the cop in the median that had said he was waiting for us. So I figured that out, and I'm like, Arnie, friggin' hammer down, let's make it to the border. There's nothing between here and there. So we did, we got out clean, we we're good to go. The traffic, the, the situation we ran into in California was horrendous. And despite having spotters ahead of us and, and people trying to, you know, give us a hand, you know, there was no moment, as Ed always says, there's, there was a moment where you could have set the cruise control and beat the record in California. But we were never had that moment. We never had that moment where, you know, we had these moving targets. We never had the chance to just put our foot down and, and know that we were going to be the fastest time. We knew we were up there. We didn't know that we were going to be the fastest time. The disguise proved to be effective, though, because one of our scouts that led us through Nevada, right as we get to the California border, we pass him, and he's on the phone with us the whole time, and he's like, guys, guys, watch out. I just got my doors blown off by a cop car heading to California. And we're like, um, no, nah, that's, that's, we just passed you. He's like, no, 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 there's a cop car just flying south. He's going towards California. You guys better watch out. And this is a car guy, right? He should know better. And we're like, no, that was us. We just passed you. We're that car. He's like, oh, okay. To me, the run was momentous. Being part of a team that was able to achieve such a feat in such dire circumstances was incredible. Part of the reason I wanted to do a COVID run was everybody who cannonballs wants to know what it would be like to do the ultimate run the perfect situation, the perfect car, and the perfect team. I found the perfect co-driver in Arnie, and the car was just about as good as it gets, and there was no traffic. And that was just so much fun because on the 2725 run, we're battling with all of the normal circumstances, the traffic, you know, the left lane drivers, and there was just nobody on the roads. And it was a lot of fun to be able to cruise at 140, 160 miles an hour and not be bothering anybody. So on Sunday afternoon, we pulled into the Portofino. We had traveled 2,816 miles in 25 hours and 39 minutes with an overall average speed of 110 miles an hour across the whole country. The feeling pulling in, um, for once we actually had people there. We weren't pulling up in, in the middle of the night. There were some people there to, to greet us and to, to film us coming in. But, uh, you know, I got to say that it just didn't have the same feeling as 2725. When we had done 2725, it was more about doing something that, 
you know, that, that hadn't been done and was possibly couldn't be done. And 2539, uh, while it cements us as the fastest to ever cross the country, it just didn't feel the same. This run had a quite a different feeling than 2725. For that run, there was really no blueprint and the record had stood for so long that it just, it had a sense of accomplishment that was far greater than this. For 2539, everybody knew that this was the time to do it. You know, you had so much less to overcome, so much less traffic, so, so much fewer cops. So while it's a great achievement, it just doesn't have the same impact to me as 2725 did. It's also kind of the Super Bowl of police countermeasures. So we just went out and set the cannonball record. And when I tell people about this, I get asked two questions. The first being, how do you use the bathroom? The second, what kind of police countermeasures are you using? And let's focus on the second. So Forrest was on here um, talking about how to make your car invisible to police. And let's just be honest, that's really not possible, but there are a lot of things you can do to kind of go under the radar, both figuratively and literally. And really, it's, it's just about having a car that's not super flashy and something that stands out, I guess, is the, the first thing you need to do to uh, kind of be out of the sight of the police. But as far as like countermeasures go, uh, just a, a good radar detector, Passport Max 360, unit in R7, probably the, the best on the market, a good laser jammer system, AL Priority or the new TMG are pretty, pretty good at defeating almost every gun out there, including the Dragon Eye. A CB has proven to be kind of useless in these days of truckers that just listen to Pandora and Spotify and stuff and aren't really too concerned about uh, talking about where the police are. But uh, a good police scanner is still pretty useful to kind of know the whereabouts of, of the cops and kind of who they're looking for at the time of your drive. So the car we chose for the cannonball record attempt was a 2015 E63 AMG. And the reason I chose this car in the color silver and the car in general was I knew I could disguise it and make it look very incognito. So what we did was took all of the carbon trim and covered it in silver vinyl. We took the red calipers, painted them gray, and took off all the badges, and, and actually ended up covering parts of the taillight to sort of disguise it to make it look like a Honda Accord or a Volkswagen Passat or whatever uh, it looks like now. On this run, we ended up using something new, which was a thermal rifle scope and mounted on a gimbal on the roof. And it proved to be pretty useful, but uh, kind of temperamental and surely not something that you probably, the regular person would want to use on a, on a daily basis. Uh, it stands out and it kind of requires a lot of babysitting and uh, kind of tweaking to make work. In my whole cannonball journey, you know, I saw Alex Roy's car, uh, Ed Bullion's car, and they had all these screens. And, and as we've talked about, uh, the more screens you have in your car, the more credible your cannonball car is. So I, I definitely wanted to make sure I had plenty of screens available. So when you're driving, you know, fast, you, you want to have all the available uh, information as, as big as possible. So I ended up running an iPad, a full-size iPad with the app Waze. So the, the primary source of navigation for our run was Waze, but we're also running Google Maps on a phone and we had a couple Garmin's in for, for good measure. So to kind of document the run, we always use the Garmin GPSs because of the uh, all the information that it captures and it's in a like, nice, easy to digest screen at the end. You can see all of your stats. But we also used a third party GPS tracker to kind of monitor everything and, and offer proof of the run. Also to document it, we are using some location sharing apps with some of our friends, Ed, Alex, to kind of document the run as well.
the allure of Cannonball to me is not only the adventure and um, the the challenge, but it's also kind of the Super Bowl of police countermeasures, which is also another hobby of mine. I think ultimately what we built was probably the the best prepped Cannonball car that's ever been built. Unfortunately, the thermal camera uh, is not really plug and play. Uh, I'd like to I'd like to kind of dial that in and see if possibly I can make that a little more user friendly, but it's not it's not looking like it's going to be. I really I think the only improvement to the car would be some sort of radar jammer, but that is uh, not not available. And uh, even if it was, it's probably not a good idea to uh, to be using. Another tool in my arsenal uh, that I that I had was I switched the registration of the car a few days before the run, just so I had legal like documentation of two license plates, just in case I got myself into some hot water at one of the fuel stops, I'd be able to switch plates and and kind of hopefully uh, skate by. So in addition to, to everything, we're also running a plane crash avoidance system, which is something that you find in small airplanes to kind of identify when another airplane is nearby. And what we use it for is if the police are ever uh, using airplanes to record speed, we'll at least be aware of it and can slow down. So if you've ever been driving down the road and you see those kind of white lines, those are markings that the, the air, police airplanes use to kind of mark your speed. And, and I know you've probably heard of some crazy tickets being issued. And a lot of those come from being clocked from the air. I think the most favorite part of the car was probably the most mundane to most people. But after doing a bunch of cannonballs, what I found is just the livability in the car is so crucial. For every other run I've made, I've got bins of stuff kind of behind the driver's seat and it's it's a, there's a lot of fumbling around and where do you put the cooler and, and you, you obviously can't stop to get something out of the trunk. So you want everything that you're going to need inside the car. So for this run, we ended up actually cutting the back seat base out and building a custom like shelving unit in order to put the cooler, put a bunch of bins so we can stay really organized. And that was probably the best thing I could have ever done for this run. As far as eating goes on a cannonball, the, the answer to the first question everyone asks becomes a lot more interesting. On a cannonball, you're actually going through multiple time zones and it becomes very hard to kind of calculate your time. So to, to combat that, we use a very rudimentary oven timer. You, you end up having to use a, a very high tech cannonball level oven timer that can go past 24 hours. One of, one of the most important things I think you can put on your car for a cannonball is a brake light kill switch. And when we're going, I always have the brake lights off, especially at night, because if you get clocked anywhere and the first thing that the, the police see is your, your big red brake lights on, I mean, it's obviously clear that you're speeding. So if you can kind of knock some speed off without them knowing it, I think you'd be in a lot better shape. Although Ed feels that uh, binoculars are, are useless, or at the, at the very least, just get them at Cabela's, a really good set of gyro stabilized binoculars are really a big help to kind of see who you're coming up on, who's coming at you in the other lane of traffic and being able to slow down in time before they see you. There really wasn't much maintenance to be done. Uh, the, the car's got 75,000 miles, but uh, I've kept up on the maintenance really uh, just an oil change, uh, a look over. We put all season Michelin tires on it because you don't want to run summer tires because you do run into some cooler temperatures sometimes on a, on a cannonball considering the time of year you're doing it. And you surely don't want high performance tires that just are, are hard as hockey pucks. Obviously I've, I've taken uh, police countermeasures to a level that most of you guys would, would never need or want, but really a, a good radar detector and a laser jammer system with the heads properly mounted. I can't tell you how many times I've seen the heads uh, going this way, that way, up and down. You need, they need to be level and they need to be straight and they need to be mounted properly in the right position to give full coverage of the front of the car. So make sure that you get it uh, installed by a qualified installer who knows what they're doing.
Another important thing is to have your phone or your tablet mounted uh, very clearly in a position where you can see it without having to look down uh, to see what's going on up ahead of you. So basically, this car is the product of five competitive cross-country drives, and we've come pretty far from the cheap car cannonballs where I'm buying Craigslist uh, laser jammers and, and radar detectors to kind of get across. But after you've done this uh, a few times, you really kind of hone in on, on what's necessary to uh, make a drive like this. Happy New Year. This time of year, I know a lot of us are trying to clean out our garages and maybe get rid of some things that we probably don't need. So if there's an extra set of wheels and tires sitting over in the corner or an exhaust that you forgot to install or a part you bought two of and forgot about that too, the best place to sell them is on ModFind. And likewise, if you're trying to find a part, new, used, aftermarket OEM for your car, truck, project, whatever, the best place to shop for those is also on ModFind. ModFind is a free app that you can download in the Android or iOS store, and that will allow you to buy, sell, transact, whatever you want to do, a car, a part, a tool, anything related to the automotive hobby. It also allows you to create a listing and then add a kickback to incentivize your followers to share it with their followers. They make it very easy to share to all the major social platforms, and we'd like to thank them for their support of VinWiki this month. Please go download their app today, buy, sell your parts. A few of mine are already listed there, and it's a great platform, and I cannot wait to see where they go from here.